the size and scale of these projects is certainly changing the dynamic of our marketplace and how the projects are being viewed overall. Welcome to the WTW podcast, Construction Blueprints, where we discuss the latest risk management and insurance trends, as well as issues facing the construction industry. We'll speak with a variety of construction leaders and experts on global topics who can help provide you a blueprint for building your industry knowledge. Hello and welcome to our WTW Construction Blueprints podcast. I'm Bill Creeden. I'm the Global Head of Construction for WTW and I'm your podcast host. And I'm joined today by our lead technology broker in London, Ed Holland. Hi, Bill. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in your podcast today. Thanks, Ed. And of course, our senior construction casualty leader, Jen Cates, joining us. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast today. Looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, Jen. I have a co-host with me today, and George. And George, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Bill. Hi, everybody. Uh, George Heitch. I am the uh, leader of the North American Tech Media and Telecommunications Industry uh, Division. And uh, I'm excited to uh, participate in this first joint industry podcast, for me at least, in partnership with construction. And we, Bill and I and our team, had a vision of uh, sharing uh, developments in the space that have been driven over the past year, uh, primarily in North America, as a result of the onshoring that's occurring with respect to uh, technology, specifically semiconductors in the United States, uh, driven by the uh, CHIPS Act. Uh, President Biden really kicked things off in September 2022, uh, announcing Intel's $20 billion construction project in Ohio, which was a, a really mega project in the space for both tech and for construction. And it's just expanded from there as many more major technology companies and and some smaller and middle market technology companies have taken advantage of the funding available from the federal government to uh, begin to onshore uh, production capability back into the United States. There are many parts of the tech industry that have seen the positive impact, but this, this uh, semiconductors by far have been the area where we've seen the most activity with these uh, major projects uh, that are kicking off all over the country. Hey, George, thanks for, for the overview. Um, you know, the activity in the tech sector, it, it does seem to have taken off since the, the CHIPS Act. The global chip shortage for 21 and 22, it really disrupted a lot of supply chains. It caused a lot of subsequent product shortages from cars to computers, devices in many industries. Also, we've seen it in Europe. Are they responding to the same in Europe as they have in the U.S.? Absolutely. There's been um, a lot of government-sponsored activity around the world. The supply chain disruptions that you highlighted uh, were really a wake-up call, not just for the semiconductor or the technology industry, but politicians, governments, consumers all around the world were really put in a position of dealing with shortages that significantly impacted personal lives and also in, impacted business results. Um, so the European Union also has put forth their own version of the CHIPS Act. And in fact, China has its integrated circuit industry investment fund. So everyone is concerned about some of the bottlenecks and shortages that occurred. There's also a lot of geopolitical concerns with respect to just how important Taiwan is as a potential bottleneck. And given the tension between China and Taiwan, that has uh, a lot of people paying attention and thinking about where their critical components are being produced, tested, packaged, et cetera, and how uh, they can ensure a, a smoother supply chain to, to support their business goals and to uh, fulfill their obligations mm -hmm. to their customers. George, do you see this in, you know, intense activity? Do you see it continuing for into 24, 25? I do. What's the horizon? I do. The onshoring or rightshoring or whatever the term is uh, used by different companies and, and governments is a major initiative. I think it's going to be something that we'll be seeing as a factor over the next few years. These mega projects that we've talked about are going to take years to complete, and they're going to be repositioning a lot of the major technology players' uh, entire um, supply 
supply chain and distribution model. So as those those mega projects roll out, their competitors further down in the food chain and also the satellite companies that um, do different pieces of the of the vertical manufacturing process are going to be considering onshoring as well. So we're seeing that that same onshoring occurring not just in semiconductor manufacturing, but in semiconductor testing and packaging, for instance. A lot of that is is um, outsourced by the main suppliers to third parties, and those companies are now onshoring as well with some significant products being launched um, that I can think of, um, for example, by Amcor in Arizona. It's exciting. Let's go to Ed. Ed, you know, great to have you on the podcast. Um, you've been a lead CAR uh, builder's risk broker on multiple chip manufacturing facilities this year. You know, as we just talked about, some of these values for single sites are ranging from three billion to some of the numbers we're hearing are upwards of 90 billion that will be in one location. How has the market for uh, the CAR, or the builder's risk, reacted to this size and scale of project? Generally speaking, um, the market really has stepped up to the challenge of these mega projects. We are seeing capacity being both provided by domestic markets and international markets uh, that see this as a great opportunity to support this uh, rapidly expanding sector. Whilst these values are indeed some of the largest we've ever seen in the construction sector, these are highly engineered projects with risk management and mitigation measures fully considered by clients and contractors right from the outset. Um, so that really has been a key driver in, in presenting uh, these projects to insurers to, to generate the best terms and conditions possible. It's excellent. And when you do look at these values, how much of it, what's the scale? How much of it is actually shell versus what's going into the building and the technology that's being put inside? Bill, it's a, it's a really critical question, this, because it does differ from a lot of construction projects. So broadly speaking, what we are seeing is the physical shell and core uh, attributes around 50% of the overall value with the remaining for the equipment that is actually being installed. However, that equipment can exceed the shell and core prices. So it is important that accurate estimated values are, are detailed at inception. Um, these projects are typically vast in their square footage, uh, with seeing campuses in excess of four to five million square feet, which equates in real terms to around 110 NFL football fields uh, from my research. But importantly, these values are being spread over this significant area. From an underwriting standpoint, we are seeing innovative solutions, though, being provided by the market where uh, the values for the completed shell and core can be transferred over to operational market before the overall construction project has been completed. So that really is a benefit from a capacity standpoint. In addition, by the time that the main process equipment is being installed, many, if not all, of the um, building management systems are in operation. So incidents that may well occur during the installation or the testing and commissioning can be managed and mitigated to minimize the overall impact on any events that may well occur during these, these uh, periods. All of these factors, if we bring them all together, what they're resulting in is more manageable, probable maximum loss scenarios, which ultimately can be assessed and then protected by the traditional insurance market. And that's what we are seeing um, our carriers supporting our important clients with. So the phasing of values is pretty important for the underwriting process. And how, how are you working with clients and what, why is that important to the marketplace to understand that, you know, to have a really detailed schedule on the increase in values at the site? So, yeah, the, the scheduling and also the build up of values um, over time is absolutely critical. Touching upon my sort of previous point about the shell and core value versus the, the equipment installation, it's fairly smooth build up during the shell and core construction. But once we are installing these, these pieces of equipment, these are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment, obviously the value sharply increase the moment that they are delivered to site and ultimately are exposed from an insurance perspective. So the visibility and transparency of our client right from the outset is, is essential in order to understand how that then impacts the potential PML scenarios, both from a natural catastrophe perspective, but also from a sort of a, a human risk perspective yeah. as well. 
And Jen, so let's shift over to the casualty side and some of the programs. First, I'm, I'm curious from the casualty side, the scale of these projects, you know, billions of dollars, obviously thousands of laborers and folks on the site. How's the size at all impact you on the casualty underwriting side? Absolutely. The the size and scale of these projects is certainly changing the dynamic of our marketplace and how the projects are being viewed overall. Certainly, from the casualty standpoint, it's very similar to what Ed was discussing for the builder's risk. We do definitely take a look at what the values are, um, considering the core value versus the equipment value. To Ed's point, we're now seeing that be similar to a 50-50 um, variance to to where it used to be uh, between 10 to 30 percent on the lower tech type projects. So, so that increase in value being of equipment um, is, is something we certainly take a look at when rating the casualty programs. Now, I do want to say when we have a casualty program that's a dual line program where you've got general liability and workers compensation, oftentimes that is rated based on your payroll. Um, another uh, opportunity that we've had to take a look at these larger projects is the fact that payrolls can be escalated because of labor shortages. So a lot of times the markets want to take a look at how the payroll is um, uh, being considered in conjunction with the actual labor availability for these projects in the certain locations. Certainly labor shortages can affect how the projects can be completed on time. Um, it can artificially inflate the exposures. That increased payroll uh, is something that we see quite often. Jen, I just had a question on that topic. I mean, obviously, from a from a tech industry perspective, what's coming to the table from our clients is is an owner exposure. Um, so obviously, our construction practice deals with contractors as clients as well. But maybe you could share with us a little bit about what's important as we help these owners build programs that are responsive to the contractors building the projects. What areas would you suggest risk managers and others responsible for risk financing at, at a technology company? company think about that are of particular importance to the contractors? Absolutely. That's a great question. And it starts actually with, um, before we even go to the markets with the projects themselves, we have conversations with those owners about bringing to uh, the table the contractors and, and their concerns in building these programs. And we always share with them that them telling their story to the markets is well received. And we try to get ahead of that with the markets and bring together those to the owners and the contractors, you know, to share the story of the project project, the pre-work that's done before they even choose the sites, and then um, the expectations of those contractors so that the markets are well aware of, of um, the needs of the owner and the contractor. You bring up the markets, Jen, and you've done obviously a number of these. Both you and Ed gave an indication that the markets are still very positive in this space. And as you share that with the listeners, each owner's different. How are you setting uh, these projects apart in the industry? What are you doing that maybe uh, sets the pace for the underwriters on the pricing or how they approach the project? Are there any differences that you're you're seeing? So I'm happy to, to go okay. first with that uh, one, Bill. Um, so in my view, there are sort of three critical factors with these projects. The firstly being the, the project location. So important both from a, a natural catastrophe uh, standpoint, wind, quake, flooding is all has the potential for significant impacts on these projects. But also importantly, from a supply chain perspective, um, due consideration is being given um, to the transportation links and the accessibility of these sites, because ultimately a number of the, the process equipment that is being installed commonly is being sourced from overseas locations. So, so we need to see there from a transportation bottleneck standpoint, how those factors could impact the, the, the construction project. Secondly, uh, the selection of the general contractors. Uh, insurers are wanting to see that the best general contractors are being selected. So commonly, um, information regarding the selection criteria is being requested at that underwriting stage. And then lastly, 
proven technology. Um, whilst these projects are being constructed to cater for the future evolution of the technology sector, construction insurers are generally uh, interested in what is being used now to build these projects. So the use of data and analytics is increasingly being used to evidence the performance of new materials and building techniques to ensure that projects are delivered um, both in terms of safety and sustainability and on time. Yeah, Jen. Let's take a let's take a little different perspective. How can an owner, or if it's a contractor, how can they set themselves apart on one of these projects? Absolutely. So many times with these mega projects, we see that this is not the first project that the owners or contractors have worked together, or um, the first time that they've done a large project like this, right? So they're able to set themselves apart in the fact that they've learned from past experiences. They're able to provide safety uh, measures and loss control standards that they're going to follow, um, that the markets are, are willing to take a look at from a different light, because many of these projects are similar in, in how they're put together, um, how they're working together with the contractors. And so um, the underwriters are very interested in hearing that story. We oftentimes see the, the owners pull together presentations for the markets that give them an overview of a, a previous project that gives them an, an insight into the fact that, that they've learned step by step how they've done a project before and how that's going to benefit them on the, on the going forward projects. Also, in similar uh, conversation to what Ed was saying, with the material supplies and demand of projects, the, these clients are familiar with the fact that there's a delay in the supply chain. And so many times we'll often order in advance of a project site even being selected, um, knowing that they're going to be doing these projects and be able to have materials up front and ready to go for the next phase of the projects. So another thing that the carriers are looking at is the fact that they're prepared to provide an actual timeline for these projects versus an estimated timeline that may end up with a long tail, a long extension period yeah. needed because these, these owners and contractors are very familiar with how long it actually will take to build these mega projects. Right. I'm going to talk to George here in a second on the supply chain issues, but I want to ask, uh, uh, just because you hit on it, you get these people together, you get the markets together, you get them listening to the contractor and to the owners. One of the questions that has to be coming up is where are you getting the labor for these? I know on some of these projects, they're expecting 10,000 laborers to be on the project at, at the peak period. Does that come up, uh, Jen? And what are the what are the concerns and what are they what are some of the responses you're hearing? Absolutely. So we're hearing from all of the owners for these mega projects that it is one of the top um, considerations that they um, look at when they choose the location for these mega projects. Um, they have um, extensive uh, reports that they do when they go into the areas and make sure that there's going to be labor availability, make sure that there's sustainability for bringing in additional labor for specialized um, needs if they need to do that, including it's the support for the communities to make sure that there's utilities that are needed and everything that will be provided. Because as you said, there's thousands of workers that, that are utilized for these types of projects. Um, but certainly something that the, the market is interested in hearing from the client, how did you determine that this location is viable uh, from a labor standpoint? And the contractors have all been very confident in their ability to, uh, to plan for that. Yeah, it's it's good. Um, George, Jen just talked about some of the issues that impact this industry. The technology space is really known for seeing over the horizon, and they're quick to they're quick to act. Maybe even before some other industries, if they start to see any turbulence or issue on demand. Do you see that? Is there anything that is of particular interest to, uh, let's just say, with the semiconductor folks that are uh, manufacturing? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things is is that the disruptions in the supply chain um, in recent history certainly are driving some of this behavior. But there are other trends that are happening in the technology space, Bill, that are really also 
being factored in by the technology companies and their customers. Um, if you think about the uh, production of batteries for electric vehicles, um, if you think about uh, what's been happening in the past year around artificial intelligence and the actual power um, that's required to drive AI, it's significantly greater than what was typically happening before. So all of that ties back to the underlying infrastructure, some of which comes back to semiconductors, some of which does not. But the the environment within which these technology companies are operating um, is very much a factor in their business planning and development um, as it ties to construction. So um, data center construction uh, in support of cloud technology is, is a major factor that we're seeing as a trend related to this because firms are anticipating the increased utilization of AI and what that's going to require in terms of independent capacity for each of these cloud environments the companies are operating on. Additionally, um, another, as mentioned, would be the production of EV batteries for automobiles. So all of that's happening as well as as tech companies are anticipating uh, significant changes, not just because of what happened historically with the supply chain, but also because of trends that are developing in uh, technology sector as a whole. You bring up a great point that I want to segue to a question uh, for for Ed. Ed, you know, you talk about the uh, EV infrastructure and George mentions that the, you know, you're seeing now battery manufacturing or you're seeing battery component manufacturing. Is the marketplace looking at these as all similar and as attractive uh, as they are the semiconductor manufacturing facilities? What's your thought on that? So there are definitely uh, parallels, Bill, between them, um, albeit though the, the, the EV battery uh, sites that are being developed are generally a little smaller. Um, we're talking in the single digit billions as opposed to the, the, the double digit billion values, which is mad to think. But the, the technology and the specifications uh, of areas such as clean rooms and things like that, uh, there is parallels there. So from a risk of loss perspective, there are parallels that the market is is drawing between the two between the two types of projects that you've referenced. And I know an issue that's hitting the industry right now, and especially we're going to say in that battery manufacturing area, is once it comes off construction, uh, it's getting that permanent property uh, placed properly in the marketplace. Are you seeing a shift almost from the natural resources world on the energy side where we'll start developing forms that take us through construction and maybe that first year or two in uh, for permanent property and operation? Yes, to a certain extent. Um, I, I touched upon earlier about sort of the various phasing of these projects. We're talking multiple billion dollars of, yeah. of exposure. And traditionally, the construction market does sit uh, slightly separate to the operational yeah. market in terms of a capacity standpoint. So once those assets have been completed, it is obviously preferable to transfer them. However, it depends how the contract has been drafted between between owners and contractors. So we are requiring markets to be more flexible in terms of their approach. Lengthier times of testing and commissioning of different trains and lines is absolutely essential um, in order to, to make these assets transferable to the, to the operational yeah. market. Good. Jen, are you seeing the, the same uh, attractiveness uh, from the marketplace? Absolutely. And I would say um, to Ed's point, you know, that the transition from your, your project uh, coverage over to an operational program is also something that we look at closely within the casualty markets, especially because your um, SIP programs will include that extended period, that products comp ops period that typically um, is triggered when you get hit substantial completion of the project. When we talk about the term substantial completion, on these mega projects, it's sometimes a gray area in trying to determine when that actually has happened, especially if you're talking about phased projects um, within, you know, within the one project, um, it can get a little dicey. We tend to follow whatever is happening with the builder's risk piece of it, I like to keep the operational programs and the project programs on the same track. So, so that's very important that we um, take a look at it that way. Then also, as I mentioned, 
mentioned earlier, we're not seeing as many um, needs to extend these projects, the mega projects, as we were with some of the smaller projects because they tend to stay um, closer to the timeline. So that helps us with that transition to operational as well. Yeah, I think the one other thing that I've seen just uh, having been involved with everybody and maybe on both sides is the need for really bespoke endorsements for these projects in this industry. And George hit on a little bit. The industry has the maybe the ability to see things happening and they may want to pause a project. They may want to uh, look at something and say, we're going to take a different path and, and readjust. We need to have those endorsements that are are very customized to this industry. And you've seen the underwriters have taken have been somewhat positive for us in that regard. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We're certainly seeing those standstill clauses come into play on some of these mega projects, especially if they shift gear mid project on um, what they want to do moving forward because of what's happening in the tech industry. I would say also, Bill, we're seeing um, some standard exclusions that you would generally see on a on a project program being reconsidered for these types of plants. Um, Silica comes to mind as an exclusion that our clients uh, by trade they need to have coverage for the the use of silica in um, the machining and and, um, the tech industry for these plants. So we're seeing markets definitely adjust their standard terms and and standard programs to incorporate what's needed for these clients. Excellent. George, you've got a unique perspective. You're working a lot with the the risk managers on on the tech side. What are they really after? Do they share with you what they're really looking for in a risk partner on these massive projects? Bill, what risk managers are really looking for in other financial um, professionals at, at technology companies is is deep subject matter expertise specific to technology construction, but also an understanding of their own industry. Brokers and risk consultants need to be bringing to the table that joint industry perspective that construction expertise that is essentially being outsourced because keep in mind, technology risk managers, technology financial professionals are dealing with technology risks as as part of their job. The very specific and unique nature of construction risk is not typical um, to them the way that it would be for contractors or other construction professionals. So that is something that that, that WTW or any broker needs to bring to the table for their clients. Um, but specific Um, Some of the issues you've been hearing Jen and Ed talk about around what's being built, whether it's, you know, the silica exposures or some of the equipment that's being brought in that's very unique in terms of uh, manufacturing components needs to be understood as well. So the the partner that's being selected needs to have developed that cross industry expertise, bringing that deep resource bench of specific construction risk management, risk consulting and broking with all the related loss control and claims, et cetera, to the table, but delivering it through the filter of the client's own industry, which in this case is tech. So there's a uh, Very few um, that can bring that to the table. Obviously, Bill, you and I have been working side by side on this issue for a long time. So I'm confident in saying, based on the feedback we've heard, that we've developed something special here. And that needs to be something that any risk professional needs to be uh, targeting when they're looking for uh, assistance with a very significant construction project in the tech industry sector. George, really good insight. I think that's going to be a wrap for us today. As always, thanks for co-hosting with me today. It's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed the experience, Bill. Always great to work with you and your team. Thanks, George. And Ed, thanks for joining from London. We really appreciate you contributing today. Thanks, Bill. It's been great to give an international perspective on this really important topic. Thanks, Ed. And Jen, as always, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. My pleasure, Bill. I always enjoy giving insight from a casualty standpoint on these topics. And thanks everybody who listened and thank you for joining the WTW Construction Blueprints podcast. We'll talk to you on the next show. Thanks. Thank you for joining this WTW podcast featuring the latest thinking and perspectives on people, capital, climate, and risk in the construction industry. For more information, visit WTWCO.com. Willis Towers Watson offers insurance-related services through its appropriately licensed and authorized companies in each country in which Willis Towers Watson operates. 
For further authorization and regulatory details about our Willis Towers Watson legal entities operating in your country, please refer to our Willis Towers Watson website. It is a regulatory requirement for us to consider our local licensing requirements. The information given in this podcast is believed to be accurate at the date of publication. This information may have subsequently changed or have been superseded and should not be relied upon to be accurate or suitable after this date. This podcast offers a general overview of its subject matter. It does not necessarily address every aspect of its subject or every product available in the market, and we disclaimer all liability to the fullest extent permitted by law. It is not intended to be and should not be used to replace specific advice relating to individual situations and we do not offer and this should not be seen as legal, accounting or tax advice. If you intend to take any action or make any decision on the basis of the content of this podcast, you should first seek specific advice from an appropriate professional. Some of the information in this podcast may be compiled from third-party sources we consider to be reliable. However, we do not guarantee and are not responsible for the accuracy of such. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Willis Towers Watson. Copyright Willis Towers Watson 2023. All rights reserved.